Marcos. On behalf of the owners and of the staff, I'd like to welcome all of you to your favorite bookstore for this evening's event. <laughs> As you may already know, Politics and Pros have gone back to hosting in-person events, along with our virtual book events, partnered events, trips, and classes, so please check our website for a full list. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, first of all, please uh, turn off or silence your cell phones so as not to um, interrupt uh, the program. For the Q&A, please remember to step up to the microphone over here by the pillar before asking your questions so we can not only hear and enjoy the conversation but to also ensure that it is recorded. For those of you who want to buy copies of the book, we are selling them um, out front at the registers. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A, so please line up again by the pillar over here if you want to get your book signed. Lastly, once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help us out a bit. Now on to the main event. I am honored to introduce Azadine Downs to all of you. Azadine is the president and CEO of the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Before joining IFAW, he served as the chief of party for the U.S. Agency for International Development in Jerusalem and Morocco, as well as the acting regional director for the U.S. Peace Corps in Eurasia and the Middle East. Fast Company ha has named him one of the 100 most creative people in business. He is a member of the Global Tiger Forum Advisory Council, the Jane Goodall Legacy Foundation's Council of Hope, and currently sits on the U.S. Trade and Environmental Policy Advisory Committee. Tonight, he will be talking about his new book, The Couscous Chronicles. In this heartwarming memoir, Azadine chronicles a life lived across continents and among many cultures, while navigating the complexities of life as a Muslim American with Irish roots. The book offers many vignettes that are sure to evoke a myriad of feeling, feelings, Kirkus Reviews calls the Couscous Chronicles an often delightful memoir that explores the challenges and possibilities of living among multiple cultures. Tonight, Azadine will be in conversation with Dr. Jody Olson. Dr. Olson served as the 20th Director of the Peace Corps from March 2018 to January 2021. Everyone, let us all welcome Azadine Downs and Dr. Jody Olson. an honor. Thank you for being here. And Azadine and I really did know each other before tonight. <laughs> and I met Az Azadine and his wife Nadia and their young children when he was country director in Bulgaria. And we had sent him off to open that wonderful country. And sure enough, he knew how to do it and do it with fun, joy, and success. You were actually pretty good at it. <laughs> But uh, this is really about the time in his life before he was country director of Bulgaria, although that is in the memoir, The Couscous Chronicles. I loved The Couscous Chronicles. One, because I was a volunteer in Tunisia, and I also ate couscous. But couscous does not come with the chronicles, so you'll have to get that on your own. But what I loved about The Couscous Chronicles is that he talks about travel and he talks about culture. But he talks about it in a way that I found extraordinarily personal because he illustrates through his examples that no matter how much we think we know, we don't know enough. And in learning, and we're learning about what a culture is on a street as well as a village, not to mention a region of a country, a country or a region of the world, but he shows in his work, in his conversations, humility. Because he can illustrate through that very gentle way that he talks, the way he thinks, is that in that humility is how you keep learning. And you learn more, and you m learn more. And he digs into the depth of what cultural individuality by person, by family, in a way that I have rarely read before. So his humility comes through. He also is very funny, and he'll try to be funny tonight to illustrate that. <laughs> but it's a very dry humor. So you're reading along in the book, and then you find yourself laughing out loud. You're going, oops, I'm not supposed to be laughing here. But it works really, really well. I wanted to just give one quick uh, two-sentence example of 
how he illustrates culture, because culture also affects the United States and parts of the United States. And he has a scene where he and Nadia, and he and Nadia had just barely gotten married, which is a whole other part of the book because it's a very special kind of a marriage that he'll talk about. But he was in the medical center for State Department getting cleared. And they sent Nadia off to another place. And Nadia didn't speak a word of English. And so they're asking her in all these forms, uh, what's your birth date? Well, one, she couldn't quite understand. But two, in Nadia's culture, they don't have a birth date. You don't know when you're born because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's lovely that you were born, but it doesn't really matter when you were born. And so she culturally not understanding, and so Azadine had to come in and help out. But it doesn't matter. I, no, I don't know when I was born. And then the culture of the State Department was, but I have to fill in this form, and I have to put out a date. When were you born? Well, you know, my mother said it was hot when I was born. And so, you know, what is truth? She, she was right. She was truthful. She didn't know. It didn't matter. He was truthful in that I have to put a date on this form or you're not going to go to Sana'a, Yemen. So what happens? You'll have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but it is these situations throughout that bring the marvelous sense of joy in discovering language, culture, and humanity. One last part, time. Uh, time skips around. He uses Arabic time, which is very different than our time. And you realize in what cultures time doesn't matter, and that's okay, and how you learn to work with when time doesn't matter. It uh, matters in a different way. All right, this book is written by Azadine. It's not written by me. I wish I had <laughs> made a little contribution, but no. So I'm going to be asking Azadine questions. I'll interrupt him from time to time. He said it was okay. But anyway, Azadine. A question that always gets asked of authors is, why did you write this book? Yeah, well, I wanted to explain what couscous was. That was really my, um, <laughs> my main objective, because people kept asking me. I thought it was a salad, uh, and I, I said no. But you know, when I, when I sat down to, to write it, and some of you uh, here know me from Peace Corps days. Uh, some of you know me from the work I do at IFA now in conservation. Uh, and some of you may not know me at all. Um, and so I thought about, well, if I write a book, uh, and it's only going to be bought by people who know me, what kind of a book is that? I tell stories all the time. Um, Sometimes I go on too long, the staff tells me, they give me a script, I don't pay attention to it. Um, but people have been saying for years, oh, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I thought, well, is that kind of a throwaway comment? People say that if you're telling a good story or not. Uh, but during the pandemic, I thought, well, you know what, I should really sit down and do it. I have, I have more time now. And when I started, I thought about, you know, the past uh, and experiences that I've I've had and how I could put it all together. But, you know, end of the day, I thought, even if you haven't been to some of the places that I talk about, whether, you know, starting out in Morocco, and uh, Yemen, and Bulgaria, uh, Jerusalem, um, Romania, you know, working in places uh, that were undergoing m massive change, the, 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 the fall of the Soviet Union, and Peace Corps went into Eastern Europe at the time, and I opened uh, the, the program in Bulgaria. In Jerusalem, I went with the Oslo Accords, thinking that I could fundamentally make a change uh, in, in peace in, in the region. But as I was doing it, I was thinking, you know, this is not the book that I thought I would start with. Um, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll find a way to just put all the stories together. But uh, as I went through it, I thought, you know what? how did it change me? How did all of these experiences change me? And as Jody was saying about time, and the reason I start, if you read the very first sentence in the book, it starts in the year 1402. And I thought, oh, well, people are going to ask, well, how could you be that old? Um, and it was something that happened to me in Fez. I literally lived in these places uh, where people didn't believe me when I told them what life was like. 
And that was true in Yemen, going in and out of the old city uh, in Sana'a. It was true in Jerusalem, where every stone has a history. And so uh, when Jody and I were talking about doing this tonight, she was asking me, well, what about, what about the truth? And, and how is it perceived? And I, I found that one of the themes um, that I thought I would explore in writing the book was, I'm telling people the truth, and oftentimes they wouldn't believe me. They wouldn't believe who I was, or why I spoke uh, Arabic, or why I didn't look Muslim, or any number of things. And I kind of gave up, you know, uh, at one point in my life thinking, well, I'm just going to tell people what they want to hear, if that gets me through the passport controls, <laughs> you know. Um, so the, the, the idea of, of time and how it's perceived and truth, I thought, I'm going to try to write the book that, that you can relate to with experiences that you've had. And, and a number of people have told me already, um, I've never been to any of those places, but you remind me of a time when I had to deal with someone who was difficult in bureaucracy or um, travel or any of those things. And so I hope, I hope that um, the goal was to, to um, send out a message that you may not be on the journey that you think you're on, and as Jody said, you know, I'm always talking about being patient and listening and letting life kind of flow over you. Uh, and then you learn. So, so that's why I wrote the book. You did it well. And you gave away a lot of personal secrets. But again, I won't, I won't give those examples. You'll have to read the book, but they're good. <laughs> what got you to Morocco in the first place? Where did this adventure begin? You know, um, I think you, you may know, so I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Morocco. But how did that happen? I, I had gone to school in Switzerland. I uh, studied in French. Uh, it was 1981. The economy was horrible. And I came down here to D.C. to actually go to um, Ronald Reagan's uh, inauguration. And that's, that's a whole other story of how I... Uh, talked my way into the inaugural ball without a ticket. But um, I also worked uh, at a restaurant, I don't know if it's still there, in Toscanini's up on, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and I met a couple who used to come in every Thursday night who had been Peace Corps volunteers in India. And they were the ones who literally said, you really must be in the Peace Corps. Um, and so I, I signed up. And I think, I think I was sent to Morocco because I spoke French. Um, and so I already had language. Um, but that's how, I, that's how I went to Morocco. And then I made up a story. I, I wanted to be in Fez. And you know, if, if you've been in the Peace Corps, you know um, you go through the pre-service training and you know, it's all supposed to be fair. Um, and uh, then you're assigned to places. Some people went to you know, Khribga, out on the plains, uh, where the phosphates were. Um, mind, I wanted to go to Fez, and so I, I actually told them, <laughs> I, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but yeah, I, I told them that I, I had a fear of flat places, uh, and, and the, the only city that was in a bowl was Fez, so I, I wound up going to Fez. <laughs> um, he didn't write that on his application yeah. form. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so with that, you found yourself in Morocco, happily. But as you're hearing from him, you're also appreciating with this book. I said he's totally honest, totally fair, only tells the truth. Mostly. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> no, mostly. Yeah. But that's what makes the book fun. The book moves back and forth in time. A lot of back and forth. And as Adine mentioned it right in the beginning. But I'm curious as to why you chose that format yeah. for the book because it really illustrates how people in different cultures and languages and traditions see time so differently. Um, you know, I lived in the old city of Fez and I lived in an old palace and it was the palace of uh, Darmakre who was the prime minister of the Sultan Yusuf. And it was decrepit and it was it actually was cheaper for a Peace Corps volunteer to find <laughs> um, a place to live in the palace than it was to live in the new city. So 
This is a place where there are no cars. Uh, to get a telephone was a seven-year wait. I didn't have a television. I didn't have a television, I think, for maybe 20 years of my life. I didn't have phones. You know, in those days, of course, you have to write letters and whatnot. Um, and so you, I was immersed in this place that literally was living a thousand years ago. I mean, life had not changed. Life had, had, had not changed. And the thing about going back and forth was because I spoke French, most people in Morocco would assume that you're, you're French you know, in those days. You're a tourist, you speak French. And I thought, if I speak French in the old city where I live, I'll never learn Arabic. And so I just made a decision, I'm not going to speak uh, French in the old city, and I'm just going to be you know, kind of a moron, you know, <laughs> stumbling around the old city. Because in, in uh, you know, the pre-service training, which you call in Peace Corps, um, we had Moroccan Arabic. So we were taught Moroccan Arabic. And so it's really six weeks uh, in its intensive. Uh, so I just, I made a decision that I would only speak French when I went to the new city and only Arabic in the old city. So you go back and forth and literally you're coming out of a centuries old place into a French provincial city, which was the new city. And I found it uh, more disconcerting than I, I thought. It was much more difficult. Um, and, and for those of you who you know, speak a number of languages, you learn other languages, you know, it's tiring. It's tiring. It, you know, it wears you down after a while. And so the escape um, was kind of going up uh, to, the, to the new city. Uh, and then I would go back uh, in a place where, you know, you see in the subtitle donkeys, and it was Jane Goodall who insisted that I put uh, donkeys in the subtitle because she loves donkeys. Um, uh, but there's donkeys throughout. So it was this juxtapose of how do I live in this one place and how do I live in this other place? within the course of a day. And that was a, that was a theme that was repeated um, when I then went to Sana'a. Same thing, you go into the old city, it's, it's a thousand years old. The, the, the gate is still there. There's bullet holes from the revolution in, in the 1960s. You step back in time, and if you didn't have those accoutrements of modern life, which we, we didn't uh, as, as Peace Corps volunteers. We didn't have a fridge. We didn't, we didn't have, no, we, we didn't have anything. At <laughs> um, but you, you, lived, you lived in space and time in a way that I had never done before. That was true in Fez, it was true in Yemen, and it was certainly true in, in Jerusalem. And I, I went to Jerusalem um, in 1994 with the, with the Oslo Accords, uh, and it was an extraordinarily violent time and I by that point I had my my family and so I talk about that a lot um, you know working with Yasser Arafat um, Hanan Ashrawi and you know other people who who were at the forefront of of change and so all of those instances um, were really about change and sometimes it was change over a year's period or 10 years but other times it was literally in the course of an hour moving back and forth and so that's why I I, I focused on that. Um, the publisher told me early days, like, well, that's kind of too esoteric. No one knows what the hell you're talking about. Um, and I said, well, the Islamic calendar is 1402. That was 1982. But that's why I, se that's why I set it up that way. I think what it does, what it's really helpful, is by setting it up that way and going between these two worlds, it gives us a chance to feel this difference in time and difference in culture. And it's very subtle in how you do it, but you do it beautifully. And so we live two ways. We live a more modern way and we live a very traditional way. I'm gonna just digress and give one quick example of a Peace Corps volunteer in one of the West African countries who was also talking about time. And she was invited to lunch. Well, what time is lunch? Well, lunch is lunch. No, 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 what time is lunch? No, lunch is lunch. And it took her two or three months to understand that lunch was the time. And when lunch finished, that lunch time was finished. But that was the time. And it, 
And so coming back to Azadine, <coughs> many of the villages and the way he creates that environment, you feel a different time. You, you let go of who we are here and now and literally go into those yeah. villages, yeah. particularly in Morocco. Yeah, you know, um, and, and the book is filled with really funny stories. So it, it depends on when and why you read the book, right? Uh, a lot of people who know me, don't know me, they're saying they're laughing out loud. So some of the, the, the stories are very funny. The reason I did that is one, because I, I, I like to think that I'm funny. That this, He's funny. I, I see that. I see the stop saying, no, no, that's, that, that's not true. Um, but um, the concept of time is, uh, particularly in Morocco, and you know, I've got Moroccan family here with me, you have Dabe, Dabe, G, Dabe, Dabe, now. And I used to ask, well, when is the bus coming? Oh, Dabe, Dabe, G, now it's coming. I'm like, well, no, I know it's coming, but when will it arrive? Well, yeah, it's coming. And it didn't seem to matter that people had more time, right? And, and so it was very difficult in Yemen, uh, and we were just chatting very briefly about chewing qats, you know, and if you, if you know qats, uh, it's, a, it's a leaf from a tree, and you put it in your mouth, and they say that, you know, it's like Lipton tea, if, if the police are around and you're going to be arrested for narcotics, uh, but if they're not around, uh, they tell you that you can astro, you know, plane and, and see America, and it's just like Lipton tea. But it's a, it's a narcotic, um, and in Yemen, uh, the, the work day, like most places, working at you know, the Peace Corps, if you didn't get to the ministry by 11 o'clock, you, you wouldn't have a meeting. People didn't show up before 11, and they were pretty much gone by 1, because the rest of the day, you chewed qats. And then you had to find people, you had to find ministry people uh, to sign to sign uh, uh, papers. And one of the, one of the stories, and just to show you how crazy it was, um, we, we had uh, our first uh, son, uh, well, Nadia had him, but I, I was, I, actually, I wasn't there. I, I sent her to the US because um, she wasn't a US citizen, and um, Yemen had the highest infant mortality rate in the world at the time, and, and uh, postpartum maternal uh, uh, mortality. So she went to the States. When she came back, uh, we could bring our household goods. And, and th there's a, a story about bureaucracy throughout the book. And um, everyone knows that at IFA, I, I absolutely detest uh, bureaucracy. And that's how I manage the organization. And I always say, just do the right thing first. Just do the right thing first and fill out the paperwork afterwards. I had to get over 100 signatures on one piece of paper to import Pampers. Right, and uh, there was one particular fellow who was just an absolute difficult person. I'll say, um, he wouldn't sign it, and he said, uh, "You should have known. You only have six months to import uh, household goods, including Pampers." And I said, "Yeah, but I didn't have a son. I didn't have a child." He said, "Well, you should have known." And <laughs> the only the only way that I got it done. And it's something we can talk about, you know, something that's miktub, you know, it's written, it's fate. Am I making these decisions or is, is God uh, guiding me through a path, a miktub? And so I said to him, are you saying that you knew what God's plan was for me? Is that what you're saying? Well, of course, the whole room erupted and he signed the paper and quickly, and I, and I, I got my mountain of pampers. Yeah. And just one other little moment in part of that same story is Nadia came and was living with Azadine's parents. This is all in the book. And again, at this point, spoke essentially no word of English. And so she goes into labor and she had two words, Papa, Papa, <laughs> baby, <Yeah>. baby. <laughs> and with that, she got to the hospital. <laughs> But uh, a lot of admiration, and you feel and see that in the book, of the love for Nadia. And uh, you feel, uh, sorry, I'm giving away your stories too, Nadia. <laughs> but this is Nadia over here. She's the girl from Tangiers in the book. Yeah, I'm going to ask a little bit about that. <laughs> but Azadine talks about her her flexibility, her cultural flexibility through all these adventures, which leads to the next question.
the book covers about 15 years. And in the 15 years, we're talking about Morocco and Jerusalem and Romania and Bulgaria and Yemen and probably five other countries I forgot. But how did you, in that period, you're getting married, you're having children, you're working through uh, former Soviet Union countries as well as Middle East countries. How did you manage? How did you all, as you describe in the book, navigate all of those differences, languages, cultures, traditions? So um, my brother-in-law uh, here, he's in the book, Aziz. I had to change your name because the publisher said there's too many Azizes in this book. Um, well, but we have an arranged marriage. We didn't know one another. And um, you can read more about it, but um, my father, my father said to me, "Well, you know, are you on drugs? What I mean, what 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 are you what are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm 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 going to Philadelphia because uh, Nadia's mom was there at the time, um, and when I come home, I might be engaged." And he said, "But you don't even you don't even date." And I said, "Yeah, I know, but I'm just going with it." And he said, well, that can't be true. And that, that's one of the things that I keep repeating in the book, is people say, that can't be true. But it is true. And of course, I embellish, you know, to make some of the no, stories. It's all honest, the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the interesting thing for us was, um, I, I had lived in Morocco for a long time. I'm Muslim. I speak Arabic. Um, Nadia was in Morocco. But uh, as soon as we got married, um, we went to Yemen with the Peace Corps. And so it was, it was a good experience because it was in my country and it wasn't her country. So we, we really had to learn um, together. And we had to learn to be, to, to be married. Um, and I, 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 I think I say this in the book that how useless men can be sometimes, <laughs> just like not really knowing what is going on, even in their own lives. And I thought, well, <coughs> I had all of these visions of what married life would be like, uh, but we were in Yemen, and uh, you know the men's life is completely separate from the women's life. She had a much, I think, better social life than I did, uh, because we were completely separated all the time. And she had all sorts of ideas about what married life would be, and she would say, well, you have to sit in the, in the salon by yourself. You can't. I said, yeah, but I, I, I like to cook. I want to help you. No, 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 you, you can't do that. I said, but we're alone. We're alone for hours. She would be doing something, and I'd be sitting alone. And then I started, she got angry at me early on because I, I wanted to have children. Um, and so I was pretending that um, I had a little boy, uh, Aziz, inshallah, that, that, that we ultimately did. Um, she got very angry. She said, you, you know, you don't know what God's plan is for you, so you shouldn't be pretending. And I'd, I'd say, well, come on, do your homework. You know, but there was no one there. There was no one there. Um, so that was, that was Yemen. She absolutely loved um, all of the Peace Corps volunteers, the women. They, they would always come to the, to the, to the house. So I, I really think that um, the Peace Corps experience, even though she was not a, a volunteer, um, she was like the mother of the volunteers, uh, particularly the female volunteers, and she learned a lot about you know culture and adapting and things like that. You know, we we go to Bulgaria. I didn't speak Bulgarian. She didn't speak Bulgarian. My children wound up speaking Bulgarian as their first language, um, and um, it's the first time she ever saw snow. Uh, her idea was to boil water and pour it all over the steps, which of course, you know, we, we all broke our ankles <laughs> coming out. Um, so it was, it, was a constant, it was a constant learning experience, um, not just about one another, what, what made her upset, um, the difficulties that we had. I mean, there was no food. There was no food to be had when we went to Bulgaria. I had to send her back to Morocco. Um, and I'd go down to Greece because we had diplomatic plates on the car. Um, you know, and she would she would uh, cry all of a sudden, and I say, "Well, why are you crying?" And no, then I found out she was crying because she was pregnant, and the doctor told me that. It's like again, useless guy. You have no idea what's going on. I'm thinking, "Oh, stop crying." You know, we're in Yemen. We couldn't leave. We couldn't leave the city in those days. You had to have a tasaria, the a permit, to leave the city, and um, if you didn't have it, 
uh, by Wednesday night, which was the weekend, Thursday and Friday, you couldn't leave the city. So we were forced, we were forced um, together in ways that uh, was not perhaps normal for people getting married, but marrying someone you don't know, how can you make a mistake? You, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Which leads to the next question, because uh, the girl from Tangiers, we, there's a, a quite a long series of activities and stories about this girl from Tangi Tangiers, and you just don't know, is this, is this it? Is this, what is this? And it goes on and on and on, and I think there is no girl from Tangiers anywhere now. Never exists. Do you want to talk a little bit about what is that whole process of an arranged marriage? Yeah, so um, I was back in the States. Aziz and I actually met on the plane, uh, and he was very proud to show me his English language certificate um, that he had uh, from the, the Peace Corps summer course of three weeks. And he said, I'm going to Harvard. <laughs> and I said, huh, are you sure? We spent about five or six hours on the plane coming back. Um, and, and really, really, it was Aziz, you know, mashallah, um, who said to me, well, do you want to get married? And I said, well, sure. You know, I, I just did my, my master's degree. I want to get married. Um, and he said, okay, well, I'll, 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 um, we have a girl in our family. But he didn't say my sister. He didn't really didn't tell me anything. And there's a lot of stories about, you know, how Aziz didn't help me at all uh, with some of the, some of the situations when... Um, Moroccan Arabic has a lot of French in it, you know, I mean, and, and uh, there's a funny story in there about the dowry and how much I was supposed to pay for the dowry, and I kept offering a visa, because um, I thought that's what I was being asked. Um, but, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a moment in my life when I, when I really questioned whether or not uh, that, that notion of what is written, that maksub, is it fate? Uh, and I, I just decided to throw myself into this situation, really not knowing what was going to happen or who she was. And, and, and I won't tell you too much because there's some funny stories, but you know, Aziz phoned me from, uh, from the States, and I was back in Morocco. Um, and he said, well, do you still want to get married? I said, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm courageous, and I'm willing to take a risk. But I have to see her. I have to see her. And he said, okay, fine, I'll talk to my mother. Boom, and he hangs up the phone. And so basically, you know, that, that was it. And, um, and then she didn't know. She didn't know what was happening. And the, you know, one thing that I realized when I wrote the book, which I never thought about before, um, I never asked her to marry me. I never asked her. Uh, there was a letter sent, which she lost. <laughs> um, but I realized, oh, I, I've never asked Nadia to marry me. Didn't you just see her once before you got married? Yeah, I saw. Which is a funny story. Yeah, so I, I, I saw. I, she was at a she was at a luncheon, um, but I didn't really know who she was. And then, um, you know, again, Aziz was not helpful. Um, <laughs> none of the men were helpful. Uh, I didn't know if the women knew uh, whether or not I was going to get married or who was arranging this, because it normally is the women. You know, it's the mothers. You know, you go to mama and you say, mama, now I want to get married. And then, boom, you know, they, they fix it all up and the men pretend that they're in charge. So we, we, saw, we saw one another at her, uh, her grandma's house in, uh, in Tangiers. And, and that, was really, that was really it. There's another guy over here who was nine years old um, who was supposed to be our chaperone. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but he just wanted bags of candy, as Mehdi. He just wanted bags of candy. Um, and so I think we talked for, you know, a half an hour alone. And, and that was it. And then, uh, you know, I, as I said, I went down to um, Philadelphia because Nadia's mom and Aziz's mom and Mehdi's mom was, was sick, unfortunately, at the time. Um, and I had this vision. I had this vision of I'm going to be sitting in the kitchen with uh, her mother, uh, we'll have tea, we'll talk about love, we'll talk about children. And I get there, and you know, members of the family are there, and um, Zulu Dawn was on television. And everyone was watching this crazy film about the Boer Wars, Zulu Dawn. And then it jumped up, switched off the television, said, okay, talk to my mother. I was like, about what? And it's like, about getting married. 
and I, 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 if, if, if any of you went through your high school uh, experience and you had a Latin teacher who told you someday Latin will come in handy, and it never, never does, but it did. And I thought of, you know, Vini Vini Vici. I went, to, uh, I, 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 I went to Morocco. I saw your daughter. I want to marry her. And her mom said, that's great. The marriage is on August 23rd. I love your blue eyes. And, and, and I was like, oh, okay. So I guess that's it. I guess that's it. And then it unfolded from there. And that's what, you know, there's stories about, I, I made horrible mistakes when she kept asking me, what are you going to write in the book? Uh, and I kept saying, oh, I'll get her a visa. You know, but she wanted to know what the dowry was, <laughs> which was very embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> Ed, you will laugh through that whole story. And I'm so happy to see these other two people here who are also very much in the book, very much part. So you're the nine-year-old <laughs> that we followed to the market. <laughs> and I mean, I, th this is thrilling to actually see you all in person. So what it means also is what uh, Azadine wrote is 100% true because there's four or five other people who will vouch for him here. <laughs> Let me ask one final question before we open it to everyone. You've lived in so many countries. These countries have climbed into your soul. Who do you think you are, having lived all these experiences that might be a little different than who you started out being? You know, um, what, I, what I said a little bit earlier was I kind of gave up trying to explain, explain myself. Um, and, and one thing that I learned was that a lot of people and I think this is what you would share, is a lot of people that you know or you encounter want to put you in some sort of a box to make them feel comfortable. And if you don't fit into, into that box, um, they can be angry. Um, they can be confused. Uh, I had one person say, you're a very confused person, culturally, language-wise. I said, you know, I'm not confused. I know exactly who I am. I'm perhaps confusing. I'm confusing, but I'm not confused. And so, you know, I, I talk a lot about the work that I do now of being patient um, and, and, and trying to be a good listener. And, and I just find that if you are patient, um, you're going to learn so much, so much more. And I, you know, I just came to, a, to the point where uh, some things just don't matter. You know, when we started out, why did, I, why did I insist on doing the things that I did in Fez? Well, because as a Peace Corps volunteer, I don't want to be taken as a tourist. And so, you, you know, your Arabic had to be good, and I live here, and, and there's a lot of anger in, in being questioned all the time. But now, I mean, I was just in Morocco with the family, and it's the same, it's the same thing that happened last month that happened 20 years ago. And it's because my, my Arabic uh, is, is perhaps confused. I, I say that I speak a salad dialect because I'm like a child. Where I live, that's what I learned. And so I, when I'm in Yemen, I learn new words. I say it with a Yemeni accent. In Jerusalem, um, you know, I sound uh, Palestinian. So I go to Morocco. They think, oh, you're Syrian. I said, well, I'm not Syrian. You know, I give them the passport. What's your, what's your nationality? <coughs> I said, well, I'm American. I said, well, yeah, but what's your real nationality? I said, well, no, I'm American. No, but what's your real nationality? I said, well, okay, well, um, no, I'm, I'm American. You speak Arabic. I said, yeah, but I'm Muslim. What about your father? Uh, he's Irish. What about your grandfather? They're Irish. And it's like, finally, I said, you're right. I'm Syrian. I'm Syrian. You got me. And then, you know, stamp the passport and off you go. So, like, everywhere we went in the marketplace, people said, well, you, where are you from? And it's, you get tired of saying, explaining yourself in every situation. And so I think I just became much more comfortable with, you know, I told you the truth. You won't accept the truth, but that's okay too. That's okay, because I'll make up a story. And sometimes they believe the crazy story, but not, not the truth. And so I, I think, you know, with, with Peace Corps and the work that I do at IFA with, with Jane Goodall, and we, we talk about this all the time. You have to have a sense of humor. Some of the stories, I mean, they're not all funny stories. I mean, I was in some very, very difficult, uh, life-threatening situations where I feared for my own life. I feared for the life of my children. Uh, my son was almost kidnapped in, in Jerusalem. And if you think, 
you have to find a way to navigate going to the Israeli police or the Palestinian security forces, and your child is in, you know, in, in, in the mix. Um, calm, you know, be calm. And this is, this is what I, I try to do in the work uh, that I do now, is just to always say, remain calm. Remain calm, and some of the problems will disappear. Some of them don't. Um, but th but that, those, are the, those are the sort of lighting guides, guides uh, for me now. I think a perfect way to end the discussion in your words, and we'll turn it down. We'll turn it now to all of you for questions that you might have for Azadine. And no cowbells. Someone said they were going to bring a cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I don't know if everybody can hear me. But There's a mic here. They they were saying yeah, if you could do that. Because it's um, it's good. It's for it's, the be, it's being recorded. Yeah. So. I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, it 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 woke a lot of memories in me because, I was in the Peace Corps in Tunis probably before Jody, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when Dick Graham was director. You were before me. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it was like very much as you described. You're a fish out of water. You're trying to explain yourself. And I kept kept saying to myself when the plane landed, "Gee, this doesn't smell like Brooklyn." Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't. Um, but it was but it was a, a life changing experience. It led to a lot of things for me in the same way it, it did for you. And I think it's something that I've never regretted. It opened a lot of doors uh, that would never have been open to me. Um, it taught me uh, about diplomacy. It led to a career in the foreign service. Um, I always thought Peace Corps volunteers could always be better diplomats than the career FSO, so I was right about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and anyway, uh, just uh, the comments that just flowed into me because of your presentation, yeah. and I'm looking forward to reading your book. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just you know just quickly uh, add to yeah. that, uh, because I'm going to speak about the book, that you're, you're right in terms of listening how it flowed in. That's how I felt when I was reading the book, that a lot of my experiences are very different than Azadine's, but he has a way in the book of having you find who you are in some very extraordinary ways. You come out a stronger person reading the book. That's so true. I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, you're just making me think about um, sort of the cultures we're talking about, you know, you, you working for the U.S. government, uh, Peace Corps is very different from the State Department, which is very different from USCID, which is very different from, you know, the diplomatic community. And the the one thing that I that I talk about in the book, and it, it's something that I I talk a lot about in the work that I do now, is this issue of uh, bureaucracy and doing the right thing, doing the right thing first, and 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 listening. And there's so many examples um, which were. In some instances, Morocco, Morocco, there was a lot of uh, violence. Um, there was a lot of uprisings during the time uh, of, of King Hassan. Um, student riots, uh, the school systems were shut down. And, you know, there was always this question of, well, who are you exactly? Um, you know, are you CIA? Are you a spy? Um, why do you know these things? Why do you go to these places? And the the... The theme that I saw re repeating in the work that I did in the places where I worked was um, the U.S. government officials, depending on who they are, are constrained of where they can go for security reasons. So, in you know, when I lived in Jerusalem, for example, the people that uh, were w that that were at the embassy or the consulate, they couldn't go to the West Bank. They couldn't go to Gaza. And so then you're sitting there listening to someone who's telling you what the situation is on the ground. And it was very, very difficult to accept. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking about your career, um, I always, I, I never was a fearful person. So I thought, well, if I get fired, and I almost did. I mean, one of the stories, uh, I, I, I almost, I was told, I was told um, by um, someone at the embassy, 
you will be personally responsible for the cessation of financial aid of the U.S. government to the Palestinian Authority. You personally, what you have done. And it was all because of language. Palestine, Palestinian, all of these issues. Um, and yet, I had to sit there and listen to someone who had never been to the places where we worked for security reasons. And so, you know, the question about, well, who are you exactly? Um, there were moments when I thought, well, this, this will be my death. This will be my death. There were bus bombings near the house, bombs in front of my car, uh, shootings. Um, but oddly calm. Oddly calm. Nadia was not. Uh, mostly because I lied to her and said it wasn't bombs, it was just the water tank on the, on the roof. Um, but I, I think that's the fundamental change um, that, I, that I saw in myself, was that you know, life, is the, the, life can end in a moment. Um, and have you done the right things? Have you always tried to do the right thing? So th that's what I try to get across in, in the book. And uh, again, funny stories, but there's some tearjerkers, I think, too. You know. True. True, and I think you do a good job of that. Other questions? Oh, go ahead. As the dean, I remember you when you were Tom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the movie, which movie star will play Nadia? <laughs> uh, well, we've been speaking to Charlize Theron. <laughs> okay, go, go, go ahead. Thank you very much for a very enjoyable and interesting time. Um, I'm very interested in how you put this together and remembered all the stories. Yeah. And um, I've been, I'm from New Zealand and I've been sitting around thinking about what life was like then and what it's like now. And um, the challenges, how to remember the right things at the right time yeah. and put it all together. Yeah. So how did you manage to do that? You know, so over the years, um, I would write things down. I would write one or two sentences down about something that would, you know, something that, that happened to me. The book is actually uh, a memoir, um, which we went back and forth a lot talking about that. Is, is it real? You know, is it, is it exactly what happened? I've read some interesting articles um, about what memory is. And the most recent one I read was, you only remember something once. And then every time you remember that you're remembering the memory. And so there's a little chink, and it changes. And this is why uh, Susan will say, no, 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 that's not how that same event happened. Um, and I'll say, no, but that's how I remember it. So what I did over the years, I just had a, a journal, and I would write things down. Um, and it's, it was all about storytelling. It was all about storytelling. And so that's why some of the folks who have read it already are like, that can't possibly be true. That can't possibly be true. Um, there's some funny stories that if, if you've been in the Peace Corps and you had Where There Is No Doctor, which is this book that we all get and we be, we're, we're suddenly physicians. Um, but that's what I, that's what I did. And, and when I uh, sat down to write it, uh, I have a very good friend in India who told me, she's a, an, an editor, and she said, um, just write, you need 100,000 words. Before I'm going to even look at it, you need 100,000 words. So just write the 100,000 words, and then we'll talk about the arc and the structure. And that was probably the most difficult thing, is you know, taking all of the stories but putting them into an arc. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I never probably knew what that meant before I sat down to do this. But um, yeah, you know, write a journal. Write a journal. Um, and and it's, it's, um, is it fiction or is it nonfiction? I didn't pay too much attention to that. All of the stories are true, even though some of them are. Even when I r was writing it, I was like, "My God, what was what what was I thinking?" You know, I I do say, and it's like, "How did I get myself into this situation?" Um, but that's what I did. So you know, you just keep a journal. I never wrote all those stories because I'm always telling stories. <laughs> no, good question. And we only have our memories. And the memories are our truth, and that's what we share. And others can decide what of it they want to believe, and that's their decision. 
uh, it's kind of frightening when you write that way, but you only have your memories, and that's what you work with. Uh, other questions? Um, you've actually mentioned Jane Goodall a couple times tonight, and we have a very special question here from her that she sent over. Well, it's a couple questions, oh, so okay. I may have to repeat it a little bit. Oh. Um, but she said, one of the aspects of your book that struck me and which I mentioned in my forward was this recurring theme of getting to understand different cultures with their priorities, tastes, and ways of treating animals, people, and the world around them. My first question is, what do you think is preventing people today from reaching this level of understanding? And on a related note, given the life you've lived and the people and places you've experienced, is there something in particular that gives you hope? And finally, animals certainly play a role in the experience you've written about in the Couscous Chronicles. How has your life, as detailed in your book, influenced your choice to dedicate yourself to the global conservation of animals, or is this all part of the same connected journey? This is from Jane Goodall. Yes. So thanks for that, Jane. <laughs> um, um, I, I think I'll start. The, the one thing that we talk about a lot together is, is hope. And, and she, she asked me, you know, why do you remain hopeful? And it's a question that we get a lot, is with all of the bad news in the world and all of the species that are, have gone extinct or are on the red list, how do you remain hopeful? And related is the work that we do with people interacting with, with wildlife in, in particular. Um, is that there's so much to be learned uh, and so much that's assumed that you know animal welfare, animal rights, conservation is a Western concept. Um, my, my friend and colleague from India just burst out laughing when, when people say, oh, well, the first national park in the world was Yellowstone National Park in 1922. He said, you must be kidding. We had national parks 2,000 years ago. Um, so again, it's, it's the theme of, of being patient, not coming. So one of the things I always say, I don't come with a, with a plan in my back pocket. I come with a mirror. And I, I, I hold it up because I want to learn from, from you. Um, Jane absolutely loves uh, donkeys. Um, and there's a lot of stories about donkeys in there. And she, she was asking me, well, why did you write so much about donkeys? And the thing that struck me um, was that the place where I lived, there was a donkey that, that lived in the house. Uh, and the fellow who lived downstairs in one tiny room was a porter. And so I asked him one day, what's the donkey's name? And he said, it's a donkey. I said, no, I know, but w w what's its name? And it took me like a half an hour. And he said, I don't know why you keep asking me this stupid question. It's a donkey. How I said, you spend your life with this animal. And he said, yeah, and, and I love her. But there was no concept of I have to give this animal um, a name. And so, you know, the work that we, the work that we do now um, and that last part of that question, um, is everything interconnected? And, and did my experience uh, in, in the book um, put me on a different path. And it, it was in, in Israel, um, hiking near the Dead Sea. And the, the last Arabian um, leopard uh, was killed. And I thought, how, how, how could animals even survive in what looks like a dead space? And yet they did. And I thought, if, if it could happen here, it's happening everywhere. And so, you know, in the 25 years that I've been at IFAW, it's really been a transformation of the organization from looking at specific projects, all well-intentioned, to what is it that we're really trying to do? We're trying to save the planet. And biodiversity and all of those animals play an unbelievably important part. And I think many of the places where we've lived, it's so fragile. The landscapes are so fragile. There's no water. Um, Yemen, you know, I was just talking to um, the event planner here. It's from Ethiopia. Uh, how many trees have been cut down uh, to, to, to plant khats, to chew the khats? You know, fruit and everything. And so um, 
the the issue of hope and 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 actually we were talking about this you know a few months ago when we uh, we were at a Peace Corps event um, and whether or not young people want to go into the Peace Corps um, there's so much anxiety uh, younger generations are suffering from anxiety and it's preventing them even on you know some of the medical issues of going forward and doing something so. You know the question. The question that that Jane and I talk about all the time is, what can I do? What can I do? Um, and there are small steps that everyone can take. Uh, but her message is one of hope, and that's why I'm on uh, I'm on um, the the foundation of hope for Jane Goodall, is that without it, without hope, um, and without humor, she has a she has an incredible sense of humor. Uh, I almost mistakenly killed her one night when she fell off a balcony. Um, when she tried to surprise me. And I said, I don't want to go down in history as the guy who killed Jane Goodall. Um, but she has a great sense of humor. And again, um, the culture in, a, in all of the places where we work, I have colleagues here um, from, from all around the world. Uh, and they look at animals and they look at hope. Um, and the one thing that I've, I've learned is that when you take the politics away, um, and conservatism and, and all of the things that are happening in the world, most people want the same things. They want to be healthy. They want a place to live. They want their children to be healthy. They want them to be educated. So, we, so one of the things that we're doing that you know, relates to these questions is changing the face of conservation so that women are taking a role that they've never had before. Because a lot of the traditional knowledge um, is, is really with the women um, and living with wildlife. So people are relearning to live with wildlife. Um, so so, so th that's why I, I asked Jane to do the, the forward and, and um, I, I think you'll enjoy it and it's very heartwarming. Um, but having a, having a relationship with animals and, you know, I don't know if you've got bears coming down into the city and all of the things that are happening it changes the way uh, you look at things. And again, for me, it's about staying calm uh, and asking a fundamental question. Are you willing to share the earth? Are you willing to share the earth? And sometimes people will say no. And then I don't know what to say. But if you say yes, then we can have a conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think this is a great place to end the conversation tonight. Uh, I really appreciate, Azadine, what you just said. And I want to say again, in the book, when you talked about hope and humor, you see that throughout. And you see in the book the growth. You're going to be embarrassed here. <laughs> but you see Azadine's growth as he has these experiences that takes him into and why you can be so profound in the work you've been doing for the past 25 years and how important it is for all of us for hope, hope, optimism, and to be humble in how we share that with others. I want to thank uh, Politics and Prose for hosting. I also want to thank Azadine's family, outside of Nadia here for a moment, but to actually see two people that I read about <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, to come and be an active part of this means a lot. And I know who you are for Azadine. And then I want to do a special thank you to Nadia. Nadia's story is also a very strong story in this book. Because Nadia, we always talk about Americans go and learn all this culture stuff. But Nadia is such a strong person. And the experiences that she had, that Azadine has shared throughout the book, is watching culture and humbleness in experimenting uh, with culture coming from a Moroccan background into what is largely sort of an American society. And you're an enormous strength, and I, I really want to lodge you also. This is a team. This is an extraordinary team that you're seeing tonight. Uh, books are there to be bought and signed. And I guarantee you will love this 
book. You'll sit down and you'll just read it all the way through because it's so much fun. Thank you, Azadine. Thank you, thank you for being you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.